The investigation into that deadly plane crash in the French Alps is focusing on one man, the pilot who allegedly brought the jet down deliberately with 149 other people on board. All the while, the captain locked out, pounding desperately on the door. So what could have motivated this apparent mass murder? And what kind of protection do flights here in America have against a killer in the cockpit? Here's ABC's David Curley. These haunting images are the first we've seen up close of the twisted metal and shattered debris, all that is left of German wings Flight 9525. Tattered clothing, a circuit board, severed chunks of a broken machine. The plane mysteriously crashed into the rugged French Alps on Tuesday, killing all 150 souls on board. But now a recording from that battered black box recovered from the wreckage may reveal the shocking, horrible truth. This tragedy was apparently no accident. In an emotional news conference, a French prosecutor said the flight's 27-year-old co-pilot, Andreas Lubitz, locked the captain out of the cockpit and then deliberately crashed the plane. In the final moments before impact, screaming passengers heard on the recording. A tragic end to a flight that began routinely. A 10 a.m. takeoff from Barcelona. Everything seems normal. The cockpit voice recorder showing a friendly conversation between the two pilots. But then the co-pilot, Lubitz, is less jovial. His answer's short. 30 minutes into the flight, the jet hits cruising altitude, 38,000 feet. The captain asks Lubitz to take over, presumably to use the bathroom, and he leaves the cockpit, starting the 10 minutes of horror. Once alone with the door locked, Flight tracking data shows the co-pilot changes the autopilot, sending the jetliner down toward the Alps. Outside the cockpit, the captain feels the plane descending. He knocks on the door, no answer. He starts banging, as if trying to break the door down. Silence from the co-pilot. But on the recording, Lubitz can be heard breathing normally. Seconds tick by, the jet dropping more than 3,000 feet a minute, closing in on the mountains in plain view of the passengers as they plummet to their deaths. ABC's Hamish McDonald was at the crash site as grieving families began to arrive. This is the convoy of families coming to visit the site of the crash. There'll be a mountainside vigil here. This is about as close as these families will come to seeing the location that this plane went down. Among the victims, three Americans, including Emily Selke, traveling with her mother Yvonne on the flight from Barcelona to Dusseldorf, and Robert Oliver, who had been living in Spain. A critical question for families, why couldn't the captain get back into the cockpit? Since the terrorist attacks of 9-11, commercial aircraft, including German Wings Airbus A320, have a nearly impenetrable cockpit door. After 9-11, what we were trying to do is make sure the bad guys couldn't get into the cockpit, so they reinforced the door to where you couldn't even blow it off the hinges. There are also strict lockdown procedures in case of emergency. The new reinforced phase two cockpit door. As this Airbus demonstration video explains, once the cockpit door is locked from the inside, this code pad provides increased security levels. A digital code is required to get back in. The red LED is lit, confirming the door is locked. But even then, the pilot inside the cockpit can block re-entry for five minutes. But of course, along with that comes a problem. What happens if you need to get into the cockpit and nobody inside is able to let you in? Or even worse, a situation like we have here where somebody's denying access. U.S. regulations require that two people always remain in the cockpit. If one pilot exits, a relief pilot or a flight attendant must take their place. This was not the policy of German wings. Not all the international air carriers follow that uh, no loan zone rule. We may be fairly unique in the United States. I think that's going to change. Tonight, some international carriers, including Air Canada and Norwegian Air, are changing their policy to match that of the U.S. There are big questions now about Lubitz's state of mind. The airline says he was 100% fit to fly, doing some of his training in the U.S. The CEO saying his performance was without criticism, nothing at all striking. The airline adds he underwent a rigorous psychological examination as part of his training and there were no red flags, which has many now wondering about the quality of psychological screenings of pilots across all airlines. This is not the first time a pilot has killed himself and murdered those on board. 
It happened in an Egypt air crash and is one of the theories of what may have happened to Malaysia Flight 370, which still has not been found. The psychological screening process for a, uh, a flight deck crew member varies significantly from air carrier to air carrier. Antonio Cortez is a former commercial pilot and trainer with 24 years of experience. He says there is a lack of consistency for psychological testing. Sometimes it can be a rather cursory uh, sort of assessment by maybe a psychologist assigned to the interview team. Uh, other times it can be a rather robust set of questions to establish sort of the, the psychological makeup of the individual. The association that represents most major U.S. airlines, including Delta, American and United, said in a statement that their pilots undergo rigorous evaluations in the hiring process. And the FAA requires pilots to disclose all existing psychological conditions and medications. But the same is not always true for pilots on international carriers. There is uh, no, no standard within uh, certain countries, industries, much less across the globe. The major screening, uh, psychological screening for airline pilots is only in the hiring phase. After that, there is no particular routine screening or rescreening of people. And one of the reasons is you're not really going to be able to find a way to do this effectively. Uh, it's much more effective to have everybody watching everybody else. Lubitz's Facebook page, taken down earlier today, offered no signs of emotional distress or clues of the tragedy to come. Today, my colleague Terry Moran followed Lubitz's trail driving through the German countryside from Dusseldorf, where he had an apartment, to his hometown of Montabar in the shadow of a castle. This is the small airstrip where Andreas Lubitz learned how to fly. The flight club here in Montabar remembers him here. They say it was his lifelong dream to become a pilot. The chairman of his aviation club says he was a very calm, responsible man. In Montabar, he lived most of the time with his parents on a quiet street in a development. Now the shutters closed, keeping prying eyes out as police carry out suitcases. The neighbors stunned. He's not the type of guy who would try to kill other people. Absolutely not, he says. Another neighbor says he simply can't believe it. He was a young and healthy man, or at least he appeared to be very healthy. Investigators are still searching for the flight data recorder and the wreckage. They hope it will help them piece together those final terrifying moments and maybe answer the question, why? For Nightline, I'm David Curley in New York.